you're coming in in the evening or you're coming in in the morning or you're in another part of the world, not morning or evening and wherever you are coming in from, we really appreciate your being here and do wanna make sure to include you in this conversation. So please do put your questions in the chat and I will be monitoring those and trying to get you know, many of you in. Um, I have the honor of introducing Fani Mitra and I uh, wanna thank him for taking the time to be with us today. Um, you know, you see his title, but I think titles uh, often do very little to tell you about the capability and leadership of someone. So I do just want to highlight that this is someone who has worked, you know, across industries and across strategies uh, for HP, and also has had a significant set of roles in the um, what I call transformation of what's been going on at Dr. Reddy's. So you can read all the titles, but I think it's really important to appreciate how important his strategy role has been uh, with Dr. Reddy's and the transformation and the organization refresh that has been going on. And then more recently in driving uh, really an important tech set of strategies uh, and doing this not only in India, but in a variety of other important emerging markets um, that are quite frankly, very crucial uh, to what's happening technology wise. So it's, it's a real pleasure. Uh, thank you, Fani, for joining us today. Thanks, Thanks Vivian, for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, terrific. So, uh, you know, I would love to just start, you know, I suspect we have a variety of backgrounds on this uh, discussion and people with a lot of healthcare background and know everything going on in India and people who maybe uh, have only a little taste or are wanting to learn more. So maybe you could just start by telling us, how do you think about the healthcare context in India? You know, what are the kind of key ways or key metrics you think about the market? Yeah, I, I, I think the India healthcare market is a, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of statistics out there in in the in the in the public domain about how the India health infrastructure is uh, is lagging behind a bunch of other markets, um, and, and I don't want to rattle off a lot of them, but I think three key statistics or metrics kind of tell you the current context and and uh, also the opportunity that's that's uh, in front of us. Uh, number one is the number of doctors per thousand people, right? And that's in the United States, it's around three per thousand. And in India, it's less than one per thousand. It's around 0.8-ish, right? And, uh, and that's one statistic I want, the, I want the audience to remember. The second one is, uh, you know, the number of hospital beds per thousand people. You know, this is again a metric of the metric that kind of high level summarizes the state of infrastructure in the country, and, and that's used by WHO and everybody else. And that's, again, uh, you know, it's around uh, 2, 2.5 is considered good. US is probably at 3.3 or so. India is again 0.5 to 0.7, you know, significantly underinvested when it comes to uh, healthcare infrastructure. And the, the problem third statistic, was laid bare during co the COVID. Absolutely, pandemic. absolutely, we, absolutely. We saw how that uh, could affect the situation. Yeah, yeah. So it can get very overwhelming. It it, it got so during the second wave, um, and so so compare that with the third statistic. I want to I want the audience to kind of uh, look at is the number of uh, physician visits per year per hundred people. That means how many times do people go to your doctor? You know, and that number and I and I, and I looked at something uh, in the U.S. is around two point seven visits per person per year, and in India it's around three point one. That means Indians go try and go to the doctor more often than the United States, and uh, and just combine it with the population of this country. We have, you know, what what the U.S. calls ambulatory visits typically are around a four billion visits in in India compared to around eight fifty ish, uh, eight fifty million or so in the United States. So that's a huge difference. Now. Now let's put these numbers together and see, you know, it's very insightful when you put these numbers together. So you have less number of doctors, right about the same number of visits, 
and imagine the workload on the doctors in india it's just it's just crazy it's just unimaginable on, on into into what's going on with the doctors there and just compare the same about the about the hospital beds you know just the sheer volume of people trying to get to a healthcare facility and the lack of it and um, and then there is this huge you know uh, pressure or stress on the on the system in that context uh, you know is where technology uh, comes into play absolutely and, uh, and and that's that's to me the most uh, exciting part of it uh, you know because uh, you know just the sheer numbers essentially are something that all the digital business models all the technology guys love you know now when you see 4 billion visits somebody is seeing 4 billion data points you know right and, you know right, right there and and, and, so, and and more information yeah. to put into their learning absolutely. so absolutely what, so when you think about what you've just described and the you know sort of technology penetration that's you know in many places started to much more increase during covid-19 you know where do you see the technology heading uh in terms of you know what i would characterize as the underserved in this market you can't possibly and and even for the well served where where might it be heading yeah i I, th- i think we briefly talked about how covid kind of shown the light on the inadequacies of the infrastructure yeah. just the lack of hospital beds and and things like that and uh, at the same, and and then and then at the same time some miraculous stuff happened in the country you know the 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 rickety infrastructure still managed to deliver a billion doses of vaccine uh, you know um, to the to the congratulations population. extraordinary <laughs> i think that probably saved us from a very bad uh, wave 3 i think we kind of you know um, coming out of it reasonably okay i'm hoping so yeah. i think we should probably get out of it so so i think i think the uh, big technology penetration uh, you know primarily uh, is one expedited by the by by what happened during covid a lot of people uh, you know realize that technology can be a solution people who probably didn't, didn't think about it that way right? i think that's that's one uh one fundamental mindset shift that has happened but there are a couple of uh, interesting mega trends that i would just want the want, want want everyone on the call to kind of understand and and hear this out right one is one is the favorable demographic you know reasonably young population right um reasonably open to trying out new things and and so on so forth so that's that's a that's a good sign but more importantly i think uh what, what the country had managed to do well is to uh create the right policy and investment into foundational digital infrastructure you know in india we have this we have we have a, we have a abbreviation for it we call it the jam uh you know one the j for jandhan which is basically the bank accounts for pretty much you know 70 80% of the population which is a big deal in this country right. followed by followed by aadhar which is our national security you know social security number right. kind of thing, right and then and then we have mobile so jam comes together and the mobile part you know i just can't stress the blessing in this guys that that it that it came out to be we have around 600 million plus internet users uh, and uh, more than 50% of them are in the rural areas and that's that's a that's a fundamental shift and that essentially is the driving force behind uh, potential for technology in healthcare you know and and that's is that i see is the is the major uh you know force that will t- probably take us forward terrific so um you know you're spending your time uh at at dr reddy's i'm i'm curious if we could spend a minute on just how has dr reddy's been leveraging technology and thinking about this as a tool to both go to market and you know transform the business because you've been on you know if you will both sides of these things I'm, sure, I'm curious, sure. you know, can you give us some sense and some examples? Yeah, I'll be happy to. I'll be happy to. For for folks who probably don't know, uh, Dr. Reddy is enough. We are a, around two and a half billion dollars zero debt uh, life sciences company that's been around for more than twenty five years. Started by a scientist entrepreneur, you know, Dr. Anjali and and, um, and and of course uh, we operate in multiple markets. But uh, you know, the entry into US is courtesy Hatch Waxman. Uh, act that that allowed genetics to come in and right and uh, and 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 kind of be a uh, 
um, first in the industry in the Indian pharma for a while now, you know, be it about getting market exclusivity for the first market exclusivity for a generic drug, uh, first pharma company from Asia to be listed on NYSE. And it's been kind of, I mean, I'm just, just quoting these to say that we've been thinking about it ahead of time uh, compared to the rest I, of the I think time. you're being very humble uh, <laughs> and I appreciate that, but I think it's important for our audience to recognize that they have been early to do a number of things and an important player, uh, not just in India, but more globally in, in certain areas. So thank you Absolutely. for our, your humbleness, but I want our audience to appreciate that. Sure, really. I think I think a couple of other metrics that I personally feel very very good about is is we have probably uh, you know uh, one of the one of the very few companies from India to be on the Bloomberg's gender gender equality you know in 2022 uh, we rank ninth globally uh, when it comes to you know Dow Jones Sustainability Index uh, uh, you know among pharma companies and and broadly have been almost 75 percent water water neutral. On, on how we operate and do business. I think uh, both from a purpose perspective and as well as from an innovation to get to the market, I think, I think uh, we've been trying to be uh, investing ahead of the curve. So uh, technology in that context, I know has been, has been a bit of a uh, early, we have been a bit of an early adopter. I look at it in three blocks and I just probably will quickly talk about each one. One is, one is the innovation in our, in our R&D space and generics. Mm-hmm. Um, as, as you, as some of you might know, is an extremely price competitive, time to market sensitive uh, industry. You know, it's it's about how quickly can you get to the market, and uh, and there's a lot of science because there's a lot of parents and a bunch of things that you will have to really take care of before you actually can come up with an innovation around how do you get a, get a truck to the market. So a lot of technology, data, AI use cases for us are in our R and D space. Uh, where where we use AI for patent text mining, you know, drug discovery from uh, chemical API to XCPN compatibility and things like that. So very very deep tech when it comes to when it comes to R and D and similar amount and of it's, uh, and it's important because I think a lot of people think this is about only clinical or biologic or scientific uh, in the in the classic uh, yeah. biochemistry world and you're pointing out the importance of information technology application here, um, which I, again, I think a lot of people haven't appreciated how important that has become uh, in this arena, but I'll let yeah. you keep going. Thank, thanks for pointing out, Vivian. I think it's an, it's an important distinction. I'm glad, glad that you could bring it out. That's a, that's a very important space. And, and the second big space for us is operational excellence and how we run our manufacturing operations. Again, generics are uh, are to be exactly fitting the FDA standards for for uh, the branded medication. So there's a bunch of work that we do in our manufacturing and quality space and leveraging data for both quality and uh, efficiencies and yields and, and stuff like that. But what's the most exciting part of it now, though, is in the commercial and customer engagement space now, given the number of markets that we operate and uh, the kind of health systems that we touch you know, in Brazil and Colombia, it's a very different kind of market compared to in India or in Russia. And then we have the United States and, and some parts of Europe like Germany. Uh, the, the multitude of health systems that you're touching and, and then the customer engagement um, essentially has to be very different. So there we are seeing huge amounts of um, digital and tech coming into play, both from a data perspective. My favorite data point for a bunch of people is, uh, you know, in, in India, for instance, uh, when it comes to medical reps, you know, we have you know, on our roles, we have around 5,000 medical reps uh, meeting like, uh, you know, 100 doctors. Uh, I, I like the way you call them medical reps and not sales reps, but I'll. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they are medical reps. So I, I think, right. I think but just the, just the 500,000, uh, you know, interactions that happen like every month. Uh, and are they the capturing them? Yeah, on their on their iPads and and they, they all use their iPads for medical detailing, product detailing. So there's a bunch of interesting use cases that come up in terms of what's of interest, what's what are we what are, what are we to communicate, how how does it matter to the to the HCP in the setting, and and now I just want you to go back to the overworked doctor setup that I was giving you, and then you're like this medical rep trying to tell you 
something about the product and it really has to make sense to the doctor that that he lets the rep in and and, and talk to him about that so yeah i think it's a very 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 interesting space and hence uh, you know both ai digital uh, a lot of design thinking elements into into what's going on in the doctor's mind before you actually talk to him about this is very interesting for us so that's a very quick uh, no, that's, that's very, very it's very, yeah. very helpful. And you raised at the uh, last part of this, the engagement with the uh, medical community and how you're using that to get out there. Can we turn maybe for a moment and take that same engagement question around sort of what do you think is happening on the consumer side? So there's the physician and how they prescribe and what they do or the other uh, clinical providers, but then there's also the end user. And when yeah. you think about the consumer journey with the increased use of technology, you know, quite frankly, especially in a place like India, which yeah. is, you know, in some ways further ahead in terms of data penetration, uh, et cetera. How do you think about how that's changing and, and what that might mean, whether it's for Dr. Reddy's or just, you know, more broadly? Yeah, yeah, I can I can talk about it a little more broadly than just Dr. Reddy's and and the and and I think the these trends are almost global, uh, you know. And I think I think this is one place where I believe uh, India we can innovate in India and take it to the world. Uh, this is one of those areas. Uh, okay, uh, but, I'm all ears, everybody. <laughs> Go for it. But, but 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 let me just let me just break it into uh, you know into into three broad trends and I'll add a very India specific trend as a fourth one later on. But uh, one of the things that we're seeing uh, you know courtesy COVID and even before that is care going remote. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, a bunch of um, the conditions conversations are now moving to teleconsultations. You know. I, yeah. that I don't need to leave home and you know COVID COVID made us not to and and then it kind of picked up as a trend. So there's a huge trend uh, and the consumer journey is changing around care going remote, care going to home. You know, so that's a huge trend. Uh, I believe it's a, it's a big trend even in the U.S. It's it's uh, oh it's it's, it's <laughs> been um, a huge change in the U.S. because part because of COVID, but then um, some important things at least temporarily, and we'll see if they become permanent, reimbursement uh, changes occurred to um, uh, afford people doing things remotely. And I and the technology, you know, people are saying they want to get as much as they can at home. So yep. it's both uh, what I'll call being uh, enabled and it's being uh, desired. So it sounds yeah. very similar, and I do. I share your view that I think this is a global, yeah, yeah, uh, opportunity. So, 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 yeah. So, so I think the entire entire paradigm of care going remote. We can talk about it a lot, but essentially, drugs and diagnostics going home. You know, there there are sample collections at home, and there's a bunch of things that that's now at home, and uh, and and that uh, just the sheer number of consultations, like I was mentioning, you know, more than four billion consultations that are happening. Uh, that's one big trend, care going remote, care, care going to the home. The second big trend that we are seeing is uh, is applicable for secondary care primarily. Uh, it's it's about care going closer to the patients. And this is probably a trend very particular to India. Uh, again, can be applicable to some of our emerging markets. What's an example of that so our audience understands kind of when you yeah, say- Yeah, so care going closer, closer yeah. Care going closer to patients is about, you know, imagine, imagine some of our tier two, tier three cities in the country. Our healthcare infrastructure is extremely concentrated into the metros, or the big cities, mm. as we say. But but more than uh, you know, more than sixty percent, seventy percent of our population still lives in the tier two, tier three. So the bunch of innovations, both with technology and care, uh, you know, there's this one latest unicorn in India called Pristine Care, uh, for instance, which takes a bunch of secondary care surgeries in in ENT, in ophthalmology. Uh, you know, uh, they're taking the uh, secondary care surgeries much, much closer into these tier two, tier three cities, and very interesting business models are where where they leverage both technology and the, uh, you know, uh, available uh, unutilized capacities, and and they're putting in the right infrastructure, bringing in the doctors to that space, and kind of doing a bit of a demand aggregation, and then the supply matching right, right at the tier but tier. they don't have to big the build the big institution big, exactly. they can build they can build smaller 
uh, but still get some scale, enough yep. scale that way. Very, yeah. very interesting. We see some of this in other parts of the world, but it sounds like this yeah. is a yeah. very important trend yeah. here. Yeah, so so I think I think that's it. That's again a huge huge trend that I'm seeing here going closer to patients. And the third big trend that I'm seeing uh, when it comes to consumer tech is around continuous care and compliance. You know what I mean by that is you know after after a procedure or uh, you know in chronic conditions, how do we deliver continuous care and coaching to uh, you know um, coaching to uh, consumers and patients? This can be in mental health. This can be in physical health in terms of you know chronic care. But there's a bunch of huge uh, tech when it comes to, for instance, nutrition. You know, it's one of these companies in oh, India called Health, Healthify Me that actually, you know, managed to put together uh, all the, you know, calorie count and the impact on on metabolic parameters on the Indian food. And it's just, you know, if you if you know Indian food, is just is just huge variety. I love and, Indian and, food. And <laughs> But if you try to put it in in other uh, countries, it's actually a lot of uh, those applications. It's hard to figure out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I, th I think there's a bunch of bunch of interesting stuff around uh, both wearable devices uh, as well as continuous glucose monitors and a bunch of other things that are that are coming up. And we'll talk. We can talk about that uh, in detail as well. But essentially, continuous care and compliance going closer to the patients uh, via these devices, mobile apps. You know, uh, apps like you know Headspace, uh, you know um, uh, Calm, or you know right. anything like that, for instance, is all is all in that space for me. Uh, so these are the three big blocks: care going remote, care going closer to patients, and continuous care uh, are the three big trends. And and there's a very India-specific trend which is about fulfillment services, which is more e-commerce extended to e-pharmacy. And I think you know firms like PharmEasy and OneMG and and it's I a teach bit of a case though. on Farm Easy in, in uh, one of my courses. So Wonderful. I'm, Wonderful. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm familiar with that uh, fulfillment challenge. Uh, yeah. That That is so, yeah. probably a bigger deal in India and some of their emerging exactly. markets than it may be in some of the other places. But this yeah. whole continuous care and compliance, um, you know, it's it's interesting. I've been around this arena for a very long time, and I've always said that that is the, um, you know, if we can crack the code on that, it is both important for patient care and your well-being. So cracking yeah. the code on it, it's also, you know, come come, you know, quite frankly, the economic golden egg for uh, a number of companies, because as you, I'm not gonna tell you anything you don't know, but loads and loads, for example, of drugs, people take them and then they stop taking them. Yep. They really should be compliant. Um, and there's a myriad of other areas. So I, and the costs associated with all three of these is, yep. is uh, really, um, game changing if we if you can get this right so that's yeah i i love the way you 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 frame that um i'm going to just remind people that we're happy to take questions so if you want to put something in the chat you know please know that i i can keep asking questions but uh, i'm i'm very open to hearing from others um i'm going to jump to the question in here because i I absolutely wanted to cover this, but we're gonna we're gonna do that. I'd love you to talk a little bit about how do you think about the data privacy issues, and maybe if I could suggest that we first say, you know, what's important about data, and then maybe talk about, okay, how do you think about the privacy piece, both in terms of policy and applications, because this is. Um, this is not only an Indian issue, but as you know, it's a global yep. question um, for us. So let's get into that. And thank you for the question. Yeah, so uh, I personally, you know, uh, I have a huge interest in AI and, and data. That's that's what I, I did for a living for a long time. And uh, and to me, uh, there, there is it is impossible to deliver better health, better health outcomes without data. It's just impossible. Uh, and just, uh, you know, and, and uh, physicians and, uh, you know, um, and researchers have been using data for a long time. And, but, but the practical applications, I, I've, I've been a big fan of Dr. Eric Topol, for example, you know, his book on deep medicine, for instance, it very touches upon 
a bunch of use cases that come in. And uh, but if you again, uh, if you just put it in in terms of a on a simple framework, uh, it's impossible to uh, do diagnosis, care delivery, and care adherence uh, without having data and uh, without having access to continuous, good quality, diverse uh, data sets. And that that kind of changes the paradigm on how we do it. For instance, a bunch of things, a uh, bunch of AI. Uh, uh, driven organizations in diagnosis. You know, we have we have some of them in India. For instance, there's a company called uh, Niramai, and Niramai actually works in breast cancer detection using AI. Uh, okay. There are a few companies called Cure.ai, and which works on X-rays and and CT scans and and stuff like that. So there's a bunch of things that I that I that are possible with it. I I I, uh, I, I know the that that you sit on the board of K Health, and I I'm I'm pretty amazed at uh, I've shared this with you, but I'm pretty amazed at the kind of um, uh, models that they have developed on patient data and what it is, what what's possible with it, you know, to be able and, and, to- And, and yeah. may eventually, you know, we'll come to a view that it's a superior uh, for patients, but it is, it, I, I hear you loud and clear. There's a amount of data. And by the way, that's always been true. Yeah. We've needed data yeah. in clinical trials. We've needed data in uh, understanding real world experience uh, with given products. So I, I hear you. Yeah. I think the most important uh, uh, positive fallout of this uh, though, Vivian, that I see is, uh, uh, you know, data and analytics can bring the doctor's attention back to the most important person in the room, the patient. You know, I, I think that's how, that's how Dr. Eric puts it, but I really love that, uh, love that frame where you actually, you know, where data is actually assisting the doctor to actually right. do better, spend more time with the patient. So I think there's, there's that is one big chunk. And then obviously data in the care delivery space, you know, understanding the uh, the uh, treatment pathways of rare diseases. You know, again, again, a company that I that I that I love to follow uh, and watch closely is Komodo Health uh, in the U.S. Uh, putting up the healthcare map. Um, there's a, there's a, there, there are a couple of other companies, Innovessor and a bunch of other folks who are actually trying to do this data backbone for, for care delivery and how, how patients can actually navigate better and, and how can the uh, health plan providers and the, and the doctors do better with that data. So that's, that's a third one. And we have well, again- What about talked... privacy? <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to make sure- So you that... and I have established the data is important, but I, I, I think. I think it's very, very. I think it's a very, very important question, and and I think the reason I was I was stressing on the need to understand is I've seen a lot of people go after data privacy without appreciating why data is critical and how can we balance both because both of them are important, and that's why I just wanted to go on the on the importance of data piece. But privacy, I think, I think has two aspects to it, Vivian. I think the way I look at data privacy, it's, it's um, almost non-negotiable. In the mm -hmm. space of uh, in the space of health uh, healthcare data, I think it's non-negotiable. I think we're probably okay with somebody watching our likes and 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 comments. Uh, you know, we probably are okay. Yeah, with people it. do <laughs> feel differently about yeah. the confidentiality of their of health data. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I used but, to think it had something to do with how products were priced and you know people might be underwritten in a variety of environments but i think it's something i've come to a view that i think it's something deeper than that i can't quite put my finger on it but it it's not just uh out of fear of being priced differently or handled differently it's it's also wanting to keep certain things personal absolutely absolutely and it's possible to do that. I mean, I think that there are two ways that we, that that we are uh, having to go at it today. Is one is on the policy interventions, uh, and the second one I would call broadly as technology interventions. I talk about. Uh, so, can about you spend a minute on the policy and then a minute on the technology, just so we can get a feel for what you what you mean or and what you see happening? Sure, sure. So, on the policy front, I think I think uh, um, there is U.S. Uh, with the HIPAA. Kind of regulations and around around data privacy and and then we see more generic data privacy regulations like GDPR uh, in from the coming in from the Europe uh, EU region. Uh, India essentially is coming up with a mix of these two. We have we have a you know personal data protection act as mm -hmm. well as another one called uh, Disha, which is for healthcare data. 
both of them still not passed, but I think they are going through the final approvals in India. But I think overall, as an as a as a as a as a policy parameter, I think right. everybody appreciates that this is just non-negotiable. And then and then we are actually putting in both policy organization structures. Uh, I can give you an. I think what we are learning from in India is, for example, our fintech folks manage to do the data privacy reasonably well. Uh, you know, and so there are and, some lessons to learn from fintech exactly. potential yeah, here. Yeah. So in the in the, in the India in the India context, we have we have a very nicely built up United you know payments interface with account aggregator model as we call it, where the both the financial institutions uh, you know as well as the uh, you know product and service providers can actually share data confidentially right. without revealing the revealing the you know identities and and managed or with consent and so on. So I think there is some work uh, there. I, I think this is still work in progress, Vivian. I, I think we have a long way to go uh, before. You're, you're before, not yeah. alone. That's the good news. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have a long way to go. I, I'm more kicked about uh, about what the industry or the folks can actually do voluntarily to protect data privacy. And there are some interesting uh, use cases and, and applications of technology that I'm seeing. And for instance, there is this whole concept of differential privacy, you know, where it's just, you know, without, without probably boring the audience with, with mathematical uh, jargon, this is how you add noise into personal data so that it's not it's not it's not identifiable very easily. So there's there's right. whole so there's of... there's de-identifying data which we all hear yeah. about, but you're also saying uh, there's also an approach where by actions you take, you yes. can also effectively de-identify. Yeah. Um, so, with, yeah. Great so so there's this whole yeah so there's a whole whole mathematical way to create uh, you know create some noise. Uh, into the data so that it's not identifiable. It's called differential privacy. And then there are there are some interesting uh, you know papers on federated learning. You know where the AI models are now you know built uh, centrally, but then learning at the edge. You know they learn on your mobile phone, but that data is not sent back to a Google, for instance. But it's learning only on your phone, and and, and hence there is privacy there that you can do. And then there are other elements like MIT. Uh, I think the I think it's the MIT Media Lab that came up with this whole idea of uh, split learning, you know, where where you can actually, you know, uh, send out uh, uh, or learn without actually exchanging data per se, and then and then the model learns, you know, without taking data. Huge uh, opportunities. That that's what I broadly call the tech interventions, the mathematical interventions right. uh, that are possible with AI. Uh, where you so can you you raise you raise a really interesting point, I think, which is there is this. What do policymakers do? And then there's what do we do as participants in the uh, business arena that may not be required but could create um, good practices and good approaches that that make sense. And so that uh, regulation does what it needs to do, but business practices also does, you know, what what it what it needs to do. There are a few more questions in the chat that I'd love us uh, to get to. So maybe if I could just, there was a question about um, the role of Dr. Reddy's in a couple of different circumstances. So one is around, you know, how did you guys um, tackle, you know, what was your role in terms of COVID-19? How did you tackle some of the demands that were placed on the, the country, the providers, but also on you in terms of whether that was demand for tests, vaccines. Did you, did tech preparedness play a role in this? Sort of, how, how did you think about that? And then I'm gonna give you a heads up. We're gonna, there's a little question in here about how tech and how you're playing a role in terms of uh, preventing counterfeiting. Um, so okay. we'll take each one. Yeah. So, so COVID nineteen, I think, I think has been uh, like this was. This is almost like people felt it's a it's a duty to rise up to, and there's huge amount of emotion that probably I can't transfer back uh, in my words. But the entire entire country coming together and say, oh, let's do something that we can. And so there was a bunch of activities that we did, voluntary activities that we did. But more on the science and tech side, uh, we uh, we we kind of quickly introduced multiple products that actually tried addressing you know the COVID-19 uh, symptoms and so on so the bunch of things that we did 
Uh, most of them were about how quickly uh, could we bring some uh, some of the external innovations into the country very quickly. So uh, from a vaccine perspective, we have tied up with, uh, I think we've, we've got the Sputnik uh, V vaccine into the country. Dr. Reddy's is a sole uh, partner for, for that uh, into the country. So that's, that's one, but we've also kind of invested into uh, some of the manufacturing capacities around vaccines uh, with our partners or at least at least invested there. There's a bunch of other things. And, and maybe just a quick anecdote because you, you've asked about tech in, in vaccines and Sputnik, for instance, unlike the other vaccines, uh, you know, had this extreme requirement to be kept below minus 10 the degrees. Cold, I was going to say the cold yeah. chain on that was and, significant. Yeah. And, and the cold chain is at a very different level compared to what we were used to, right? There, there were always these cold chains that could take it up to like uh, zero to minus three degrees centigrade, but this, this, this is sub minus 10 degrees centigrade. So we had to literally uh, one set up our own cold chain for it. But more importantly, we kind of brought in the advantages of IoT uh, devices. So every case had been slapped with, a, with an IoT tagging device and we could actually track the vaccine all the way to the healthcare facility and know which which box is at what temperature, and and where we could actually have you know we actually set up a central control room where we could actually monitor this entire thing on a map across healthcare facilities and say what is the condition of these vaccines and uh, huge amount of obviously data IoT mobile applications and a bunch of you know uh, things that go along with it. So tech essentially helped us helped us do that and 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 get there get there pretty quickly as well. Yeah, so uh, I think it, it was also a bit of a lesson in innovating quickly. Uh, I think it has been that for pretty much everybody across the world, but the the impetus and the kind of things uh, uh, that it that that it shone light on some of the inefficiencies in our innovation process as well, and say, oh, probably we didn't need this all along. And I think, I think this is a uh, universal learning, which is, yeah. you know, I had an executive come speak to one of my classes who said, you know, we used to do these. 24 steps for making a decision. And during this, you know, we basically realized in about four steps, yeah. you know, the back and forth reviews, the amount of time, you know, no less debate on the core, but yeah. a lot of the miscellaneous, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. we, we, and I'm, I'm hoping that we don't go, you know, when people talk <laughs> about the next normal, I really hope it's not going backward go back. only, but it really is taking uh, the, the best of this. Maybe you could comment a moment on this counterfeiting question that's come up in the chat, which is how do you see your journey on drug counterfeiting programs? This, this remains a concern around the world right. in terms of yeah. making sure that the product you think you're getting is in fact a legitimate, um, carefully prepared, properly manufactured, uh, properly delivered product. Not yeah. just that it went bad in the cold chain, but it was good to begin with. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think the overall counterfeiting and the drug track and trace, as we broadly call it in the, right. in the, in the it, industry, uh, yeah. is, is again is again a, a sweet spot between policy and uh, you know regulation and technology. I think I think US uh, is one of our lead markets where we have a very strong track and trace tech in place where every product, every box, every every pack that goes out. This is has actually, been a big, this has been a focus to some degree of the big. FDA and wanting a proper yeah. track and trace program. Absolutely, absolutely. So even if it is any form of medication, you can type in the QR code or, or, the, or the respective batch number and you'll know exactly where it all, where it, where it hopped over, which distributor did it go through and, and the whole history of that of that pack, I think uh, we've made we made reasonable progress uh, again because it's more an industry uh, level intervention. Uh, right. So we see that, we see that possible. We are also evaluating certain uses of blockchain and 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 potential use cases around that. Uh, you know, to see if some of our markets can use that tech. Uh, again, it's a very very nascent tech, but most of the underlying technology for counterfeiting does exist now it's mostly about implementation and the and the country specific regulations i i, I personally think we are, we are reasonably ready for that uh, all the way from our manufacturing into the market uh, the, the, there was a question in the chat earlier about you know the roles regulators can play in or in terms of in policy in terms of technology and this is an example 
you know, if there could be, you know, just as there is in, you know, I, I think a lot of people may not appreciate that in the airline industry, most airlines really globally adhere to a set of standards and a yep. set of behaviors. And it's one of the reasons we all feel pretty safe uh, when we get on an airplane, irrespective of the company. And here uh, I could imagine that there's an opportunity perhaps for some uh, collective action. Maybe I could pull us back up a moment and go back to the marketplace of innovation and, and ideas. And I, I'd love to hear um, sort of how, as we move forward, you know, how is the India health tech market shaping up? And, you know, how hard is it to get funding to do innovative things? Um, you know, is there a real set of unicorns coming out here? Like what, what's happening? And what do you think, you know, give us a kind of future view, if you would, not just what's happening today. Yeah, so I think I think India Health Tech is just about starting up, if you ask me, uh, you know, uh, while there were- That's good know, news for all our students. Yeah, <laughs> I it's, think. Just about warming, it's just about warming up. Uh, actually, 2021 has been, has been pretty good. Uh, there, there was around, Two two and a half billion dollars of investments that went in total investments roughly in the five six billion dollar range uh, from a, from a VC funding perspective uh, into the health tech in the country, but but uh, the reason I say it's still warming up is it's yeah. it still lags behind our fintech and uh, you know e-commerce funding uh, you know uh, speeds in some form and that's that's also the maturity of the market as we see it. So I, I, the way I would, I think at the, I like the way you asked what is it in the future, because I think, I think sometimes uh, we underestimate because we're just doing this very bad extrapolation, linear extrapolation to say, okay, this is what it's going to look like. It's always going to be like this. Yeah. Well, there's either that or the hockey stick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah what are the stick. other? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think the, I think that there are, there are two, two, three things that are coming together for us, Vivian. I think one of the, one of the most interesting things again uh, is from a, policy perspective. And that is what has happened to us in FinTech. You know, India came up with this entire concept of UPI, United Payments Interface, where banks could talk to each other. It was almost a digital public good, for lack of better word, in the economic term. Uh, but but then the, the sheer number of startups that started getting built on it was just yeah. incredible. And that's about... Because there was some clarity. There's clarity, there is infrastructure that there is, I think the biggest thing is there's public infrastructure now that, that actually works. There, there is at least a, you know, a, an exchange bus of sorts and now you can actually plug in your in, innovative ideas onto it. I think what's happening in the health, in the healthcare space for India is we are just about getting that integrated, integrated interface started. And we have this huge concept of United Health, uh, you know, identity, Unified Health Identity, UHI. And there's a huge right, which is different for those of you in the United States who are thinking about United Healthcare, the company. <laughs> That's not what we're talking no, about here. No, no, it's a, it's a unified health ID, just like just like your Aadhaar or your Social Security. You have one ID, and that you can exchange your healthcare records securely with any participant. I think that's one big shift that's going to drive a lot of innovation because. What what plagued India healthcare is the is the lack of digitization of these health records, and so. A lot of it was on paper. It was not. Not only plagued on India, it's plagued a lot of places. <laughs> so, so I, I think with this, with this change, and because of the penetration of mobiles and internet, I believe that we're going to we're going to kickstart this and and drive pretty fast from here. And and I see that happening in the next five to seven years. It's just going to be a very very different place, just because we will have that infrastructure in place. That's number one. Number two, that that's going to change is the demand for quality healthcare with the rising standards, I think people have now started demanding better. And that that demand and the and the ask that we can actually get better and get better services, better quality, better price. Once the consumers get a taste of it, I think the market just switches suddenly. And that's that's happening. And it happened with us in education. It happened with us in, in finance. We lived with very, very old banks for a long time. And suddenly we, we say, oh no, we deserve better. And it suddenly started changing. 
and that is actually seeping now into the healthcare and hence there is a huge consumer interest understanding so when you put these two together they, that is that is a good fertile space for uh, money and innovation to come in there are going to be startups who will who will who will try and break in they of course some of them will fail but that's going to start off a huge uh, you know huge uh, virtuous cycle i hope but these two are my, you know, my and, it's, and it's interesting what you didn't say was we we have to have absolute regulatory uh certainty yeah. um because <laughs> I, I teach a course on leading in uncertainty and crisis. And one of the uncertainty issues that sometimes stops businesses is, is regulatory uncertainty. And we mentioned Farmeasy earlier, but they didn't, they didn't, they kept going even in the face of some regulatory uncertainty. So it's it's quite an interesting thought that as long as the core infrastructure and the consumer demand are there. Um, at least in the Indian context, progress uh, can can go forward. Um, the uh, uh, the I guess there's another question I have, and again, if there's any further questions, please put them in the chat because we are starting to get towards towards the end of our time. But um, I'm going to ask you this question, and I may even add my own answer on this one, which is, you know, what's your advice uh, to future leaders uh, who are thinking of careers in health tech or thinking of careers in pharma tech? And, you know, what, what would you suggest to them? And, and maybe include in that a little bit about, you know, your vision. So you've talked about some key things going on, but what do you see and what would you advise them going forward? Yeah, here, here I think I think I have I have some generic generic advice and, and then we'll, we'll add a bit of health tech to it. I think I think some of the fundamental principles are not very different. But uh, you know, uh, the first one for me is uh, the ability for a leader to identify a problem or an inefficiency in the system and say that okay, this is you know. Every, every time you see that, uh, that's an arbitrage opportunity to both make an impact and create value. There's this can I, can I put pause on this for a minute, just for the group? Absolutely. I, very early on in my career, someone told me, just because it is a new feature does not mean it's a benefit. Yep. And you've said something very important. Where is the problem? Where's the inefficiency? So it's got to be not just a feature. It's got to have a benefit. Absolutely. Look for where you can create a benefit. That's a very powerful idea. I'll let you keep going. Yeah, yeah. And, and hence, I mean, that, that's while it is true for every industry, I think the healthcare systems across the world, and I see, I've seen some of them even in emerging markets, and I'm sure in the US, uh, yeah. there are huge opportunities to jump in and make an impact because there is inefficiency on cost, quality of care, patient experience, there's so many things that we can do better. And hence, I think I think that's number one, you know, can you find that problem? Can you find that inefficiency? That's number one. Number two, uh, for me is what I think um, is better articulated by Paul Graham. Um, but it's about doing things that don't scale uh, before you think of actually scaling. And uh, what that essentially talks about is are you willing to do things that are difficult and tedious upfront? You know, it's not it's not going to be easy, but it's it's going to be important. And and I see I see for example, you know, work that uh, like I talked about Komodo Health. You know, they're just trying to put these huge data sets together, trying to stitch them together, and and it was a bunch of very very difficult work upfront. And I know I know that that for instance, Vivian, you sit on the board of Signify, and the kind of you know, mindset shift, I'm sure they try to bring in when they say, okay, I can do this better at home. I can do, you know, I can do interesting things. Uh, I can, I can price it by outcomes and things like this. Just, just difficult things right. to get through. Right. And, uh, or, or even back to K Health for a minute, their original data set was from Maccabi. You know, you don't make it work overnight. I mean, absolutely. patience. I'm hearing a little bit of patience and perseverance. I think I think that's the that's the part. You know, are you willing to do things that don't scale, and 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 that's that's going to be interesting. And then a bunch of uh, and then the third one is actually, you know, if you have to do one and two, you need a huge amount of passion to make that impact. And and healthcare industry, I think, is 
probably one of the one of those complex multi-variable highly regulated industries and if you really can stick around and and really uh you know uh, have the passion to make an impact uh, i think i think you can get it's not for the weak hearted i would say uh, you know <laughs> and and it's and it's a very interesting and it and it demands a very interesting combination of people i've seen vivian is you know you have you have on one hand uh, a huge respect for rigor you know uh, that's that's one quality and then there is a bit of irreverence to believe that the system needs to change and i'm going to change it in some form it's it's a very 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 difficult combination of uh, you know that you find in people but if you got the respect for rigor because 90% is not good enough 90% right. right is not good enough uh, but you also have this irreverence to say okay it has been like that for a while but i think it needs to change today and that takes a bit of passion so combine the ability to identify problems doing things the, the willingness to do things that don't scale and the right passion um, you know to to make it happen i think uh, these are absolutely three critical qualities i can think of uh, you know if you want to play in this industry uh so thoughtful i i really love that um may i add one more okay please okay you... so my my one more is you know for uh years in the us we talked about improving quality lowering cost you know increasing access or convenience or the you know kind of the experience and you know people used to say uh when i was growing up i'm still not completely there um you can't you know improve all of these things uh at once you can only really do one and i actually think that if you are thinking about an innovation or thinking about doing something fo going forward if you're not improving on at least two of these uh you should really think twice and truthfully depending on the market if all you're doing you know is increasing costs boy it better be something extraordinary in terms yeah. of outcomes and access to those outcomes uh but but really getting your head around the fact that um you you shouldn't assume you you should try to improve on multiple dimensions and not settle uh for only for only one um because eventually these systems have to get paid for you know by society they they have to get used so i think we have time for one more question and this is uh from the audience and oh boy there's some really good questions that came in very late so maybe we'll try to get in two of these questions but what do you think are um the most important lesson that we can learn from the huge loss of life and livelihood from the pandemic and is there a solution out there? I think, um, given where we are, we ought to acknowledge. I, I tried not to focus on that today, but I think we have to acknowledge that uh, is still part of our lives. So, what's the lesson that the global healthcare industry learned? And is is there, you know, some solutions out there, especially for the detection, early detection? Of viruses. Yeah, I, I think uh, there. I mean, in retrospect, all of us can sound very intelligent, but really, I, uh, I personally think we've we've all learned a lesson. Uh, you know, when we lost loved ones, a bunch of us did. Um, I, I think the the biggest one uh, that for me is uh, is acknowledging the acknowledgement of the problem and then and then going at it very quickly. I think I think we've done reasonably well, uh, where folks came together across boundaries, across companies shared information and did what is the right thing so i really want to acknowledge how how you know governments and private institutions came together to do come up with vaccines come up with uh, you know interesting innovations around around drugs and, and things like that what it also showed up is the inadequacy of the health systems and i think we have yeah. now started to talk about it that no the surveillance system. systems you yeah you know. yeah so so one step before surveillance vivian is also the that that however good your health infrastructure is if it gets overwhelmed like that it's just not feasible to to handle that kind of uh, that kind of pandemic 
And hence, the bunch of things that we're talking about, care, care going remote, care going closer to home, uh, strengthening our primary health infrastructure. I think a bunch of us learned the lessons around that, uh, that our primary health infrastructures are going to be a mm -hmm. lot more important. What we can do for patients at home is going to be a lot more important. I think that's a big lesson. And I think there's going to be both uh, thinking and money that I think will follow. And that's the right thing to do, that we take uh, people People should not necessarily come to the hospitals if they don't have to. You know, a whole better place. You know, they should they should get their get their care there. I think that's going to be a big shift, and it's an important lesson that I think we've we have learned as well. I think the the more important thing that you raised is about surveillance. You know, how do you attract people? You know, what is uh, how do you you know? And that there's an amount of uh, you know human behavior and and thinking about it. You know, what what makes you care for other people? How much of, of your privacy are you willing to give up? And it raises some very interesting questions. I think it's way beyond our current conversation, but it's a very, very uh, interesting, conflicting set of questions about what's, you know, how do you, uh, what is privacy and what is your personal behavior versus public behavior and stuff like that. I think it's a very interesting set of lessons, at least questions that it raised. I think, I don't know whether we have learned all the lessons yet, but. Yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I would add one and I'm struck by, um, I think we, we will, I pray or hope that societies will continue to put in what I'll call the investment into technology and what I'll call the sort of scientific capital. I worry that we will not put in the necessary investment in human capital um, in terms of the needed personnel uh, to take care of people, but also the needed insight to rebuild trust in okay. institutions and trust in our fellow human beings, that we, um, uh, we, we really have a question of, um, even if I'm at low risk, but the community is at high risk, what is Absolutely. my obligation? Where do I have rights, but also where do I have responsibilities? And I, I think we have uh, work to do. Um, and I think it's everywhere. I, you know, I, I, for a while, I thought this was sort of a uniquely uh, US and maybe a few other countries, but I'm beginning to believe it's, it's a larger question about rights and responsibilities that I think we still have, uh, still have human work uh, to, to, to do. Um, I'm mindful that we're supposed to end on time. I could keep going. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I really want to thank everyone for joining us. And I really want to thank you, Fani. And I want to turn it back to our organizers uh, for anything uh, else, I think we've had some closing thoughts here on the pandemic, uh, and I, I want to make sure uh, you all can pick it up from here. But thank you all. It was very fun uh, and very interesting. Thank you, thank you Vivian. Um, thank you, Fanny. Uh, just, just as a last closing remarks, Fanny, we would love to hear you know, a, a few words from you uh, before we move on to the next one. Yeah, so I, I personally think it's probably the most exciting time to be in, in healthcare and tech and the combination. I think Vivian raised a very important point about human-centered design and, and the thinking about, you know, uh, I think that's a very important point. We kind of go off on infrastructure and technology, but the human element and how do you design for compliance, design for adoption, I think it's going to be a very interesting uh, intersection. And, uh, you know, I'm I'm sure everyone who is looking forward to a career in here, this is probably the best time to be around. I think a lot of hard work is done. Um, there is a lot of uh, foundational infrastructure in place. I think it's about come and build more, you know. Terrific, we're all gonna come visit you. <laughs> Absolutely, anytime, Vivian. <laughs> okay, thank that's great. Uh, thank you, Fanny and Vivian again for, for a very insightful and very interactive session. Um, the audience were having a great time time getting their questions answered and hearing from both of you. Uh, I hope you have a great day. We are going to take a 15 minutes break here uh, and, and you come back with the education panel where again we'll talk about how technology has revolutionized that space. Um, see you all in 15 minutes.
Thank you. Have a good, have a good evening or a good day. Thank you. Thank you.